The first Battle of Smolensk was a battle during the second phase of Operation Barbarossa, the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union, in World War II. It was fought around the city of Smolensk between 10 July and 10 September 1941, about 400 kilometers west of Moscow. The Ossia had advanced 500 kilometers into the USSR in the 18 days after the invasion on the 22nd of June 1941. The Soviet 16th, 19th and the 20th armies were encircled, and destroyed just to the east of Smolensk, though many of the men from the 19th and 20th armies managed to escape the pocket. Some historians have asserted that the cost to the Germans during this drawn-out battle and the delay in the drive towards Moscow led to the victory of the Red Army in the Battle of Moscow of December 1941. Chapter 1 – Background and Planning On the 22nd of June 1941, the Axis nations invaded the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. At first, the campaign met with spectacular success, as the surprised Soviet troops were not able to offer coordinated resistance. After three weeks of fighting, the Germans had reached the Divinar and Dnieper rivers and planned for a resumption of the offensive. The main attack, aimed at Moscow, was carried out by Army Group Center. Its next target on the way to the Soviet capital was the city of Smolensk. The German plan called for the 2nd Panzer Group to cross the Dnieper, closing on Smolensk from the south, while the 3rd Panzer Group was to encircle the town from the north. After their initial defeats, the Red Army began to recover and took measures to ensure a more determined resistance and new defensive line was established around Smolensk. Stalin placed Field Marshal Semyon Timoshenko in command and transferred five armies out of the strategic reserve to Timoshenko. These armies had to conduct counter-offensives to blunt the German drive. The German high command was not aware of the Soviet build-up until they encountered them on the battlefield. Facing the Germans along the Dnieper and Divinar rivers were stretches of the Stalin line fortifications. The defenders were the 13th Army of the Western Front, and the 20th Army, 21st Army and the 22nd Army of the Soviet Supreme Command Reserve. The 19th Army was forming up at Vitebsk, while the 16th Army was arriving at Smolensk. In Soviet histories, the Great Battle of Smolensk is divided into the following phases and operations. Smolensk Defensive Operation Smolensk Offensive Operation Rodjechev Zhilobin Offensive Operation Domol Trubchevsk Defensive Operation Dahovskina Offensive Operation Yelnia Offensive Operation Roslavl Novozipkov Offensive Operation The German OKH OK lists the following operations around Smolensk. Battle of Smolensk Defensive Battle near Smolensk and Yelnia Battle of Roslavl Battle of Krichev and Gomel Battle of Velikai Luki Chapter 2 – The Operation Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Phase 1 – The Encirclement Battle and the first Soviet counterattacks. Prior to the German attack, the Soviets launched a counteroffensive. On the 6th of July, the 7th and 5th mechanized corps of the Soviet 20th Army attacked with about 1,500 tanks near Lepil. The result was a disaster, as the offensive ran directly into the anti-tank defenses of the German 7th Panzer Division, and the two Soviet mechanized corps were virtually wiped out. On the 10th of July. Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group began a surprise attack over the Dnieper, his forces overran the weak 13th Army, and by 13 July, Guderian had passed Mogilyov, trapping several Soviet divisions. His spearhead unit, the 29th Motorized Division, was already within 18 kilometers of Smolensk. The 3rd Panzer Group had attacked, with the 20th Panzer Division establishing a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Divinar River, threatening Vitebsk. As both German panzer groups drove east, the 16th, 19th and 20th armies faced the prospect of encirclement around Smolensk. From 11 July, the Soviets tried a series of concerted counterattacks. The Soviet 19th Army, and 20th Army struck at Vitebsk, 
while the 21st and the remnants of the 3rd Army attacked against the southern flank of 2nd Panzer Group near Bobruisk. Several other Soviet armies also attempted to counter-attack in the sectors of the German Army Group North and Army Group South. This effort was apparently part of an attempt to implement the Soviet pre-war general defense plan. The Soviet attacks managed to slow the Germans but the results were so marginal that the Germans barely noticed them as a large coordinated defensive effort, and the German offensive continued. Hoff's 3rd Panzer Group drove north and then east, parallel to Guderian's forces, taking Politska and Vitebsk. The 7th Panzer Division and 20th Panzer Division reached the area east of Smolensk at Yartsevo on July 15. At the same time, the 29th Motorized Division, supported by the 17th Panzer Division broke into Smolensk, captured the city except for the suburbs and began a week of house-to-house -house fighting against counter-attacks by the 16th Army. Guderian expected that the offensive would continue towards Moscow as its main focus and sent the 10th Panzer Division to the Desna River to establish a bridgehead on the east bank at Yelnya and cleared that as well by the 20th. This advanced bridgehead became the center of the Yelnya offensive, one of the first big, coordinated Soviet counter-offensives of the war. This objective was 70 kilometers south of the Dnieper and well clear of the objective of liquidating the armies trapped at Smolensk. Under Führer Directive 33 issued on July 14, the main effort of the Wehrmacht was reorientated away from Moscow towards a deep encirclement of Kiev in Ukraine and Bok was becoming impatient, wanting Guderian to strike north and link up with Hoth's panzer group so resistance in the city could be mopped up. On July 27, Bok held a conference at Novi Borisov, which was also attended by Commander in Chief Walther von Braukic, the head of the Oberkommando de Harris the supreme high command of the Wehrmacht. The generals were required to sit without an opportunity to comment, while a memorandum was read to them by one of Braukic's aides, instructing them that they were to strictly follow Führer Directive 33 and were under no circumstance to try to push further east. They were ordered to concentrate on mopping up, refurbishing equipment, restocking supplies and straightening the German front line, which had become more of an S-shape due to the advances of Guderian and Hoth. Coming away from this meeting, Hoth and Guderian were angry and frustrated. Guderian wrote in his journal that night that Hitler preferred a plan by which small enemy forces were to be encircled, and destroyed piecemeal and the enemy thus bled to death. All the officers who took part in the conference were of the opinion that this was incorrect. Whether or not this was true, it was this meeting that some have pointed to that marked a critical point where the Wehrmacht leadership broke trust with Hitler. After returning to his post, Guderian conspired with Hoth and Bock to delay the implementation of Directive 33, in defiance of the orders of the Führer and O.K.G. Guderian hastily put together a plan of attack for his and Hoth's forces for August 1, the roslevel novozipkov offensive operation. In the north, the 3rd Panzer Group was moving much more slowly. The terrain was swampy, made worse by rain and the Soviets were fought to escape the trap. On the 18th of July, the armored pincers of the two Panzer Groups came within 16 kilometers of closing the gap. Timoshenko put newly promoted Konstantin Rokossovsky, who had just arrived from the Ukrainian front, in charge of assembling a stopgap force which held the attack of the 7th Panzer Division and with continuous reinforcements, temporarily stabilized the situation. The open gap allowed Soviet units to escape that were then pressed into service, holding the gap open. The Soviets transferred additional troops from newly formed armies into the region around Smolensk, namely the 29th, 30th, 28th, and 24th armies. These newly built formations would, immediately upon arrival, start a heavy counterattack against the German forces around the Smolensk area from 21 July on. This put a heavy strain on the overextended Panzer forces, which had to cover a large area around the perimeter. However, poor coordination and logistics on the part of the Soviets allowed the Germans to successfully defend against these offensive efforts, while continuing to close the encirclement. The Soviet attacks would last until 30 July, when the Germans finally repelled the last of them. Finally, on the 27th of July, the Germans were able to link up and close the pocket east of Smolensk, 
trapping large portions of 16th, 19th, and 20th armies. Under the leadership of 20th Army, Soviet troops managed to break out of the pocket in a determined effort a few days later, assisted by the Soviet offensive efforts along the Smolensk front line. On 5 August von Bock reported that a total of 309,000 prisoners had been captured during the Battle of Smolensk at all. This number later increased to 350,000. Thus, only about 50,000 people from the encircled 16th and 20th Armies escaped from the cauldron by 7 August. Chapter 2 Section 2, Phase 2, The German Offensives on the Flanks and the Further Soviet Counteroffensives after the battle for encirclement near Smolensk ended on 5 August, the opponents drew different conclusions. The Soviet command was satisfied that they managed to restore the front line on the road to Moscow and save part of the encircled armies. It was decided to continue to strike at the opposing German forces, despite high losses. Thus, from their point of view, the battle was just beginning. In the following month, there were two major Soviet offensives, 6-24 August and 29 August, 12 September 1941. On the part of the Germans, opinions were divided, von Bock believed that the battle was over, and after rest and replenishment, the troops of Army Group Center could continue their successful offensive against Moscow. However, Hitler was preoccupied with the stubborn defense of the Soviet southwestern front near Kiev and the increasing resistance of the Soviet troops of Zhukov and Timoshenko in the Moscow direction. On the other hand, Guderian's victory at Roslavl, on the right flank of Army Group Center, opened up the possibility of an attack to the south and a gigantic encirclement of Soviet troops near Kiev. Gradually O.K.H. leaned towards Hitler's opinion. However, Neither Bock nor Hitler planned an immediate offensive directly on Moscow, and the need to constantly repel Soviet strikes exhausted the troops. Von Bock wrote, I was now forced to commit all of my combat-capable divisions from the army group's reserve into combat. We needed every man forward. In spite of huge losses, the enemy attacked daily in several sectors so that, up to this time, it has not been possible to regroup forces and bring up reserves. Thus, in the next month after the elimination of the cauldron near Smolensk, von Bock's armies defended themselves in the center and attacked with limited forces on the flanks. In the south, Guderian won the battles near Gomel and Krichev, and in the north, Group Schumer captured Velikai Luki and advanced further to the east to Andripol. Most of the attacks of the Soviet troops were successfully repelled, but the Germans had to be withdrawn from the salient near Yelnya. Chapter 3 – Casualties and Losses Official Soviet data on losses in the Battle of Smolensk were disclosed only in 1993. According to the study by a team of authors led by Grigory F. Krivoshev, the troops of the Four Fronts and the Soviet Pinska Naval Flotilla lost a total of 486,171 people irrevocably. 273,803 people wounded. In total, 759,947 people. What part of the 486,171 irrecoverable losses relates to the killed and what part to the prisoners of war is not indicated? The Germans reported the following number of prisoners for some operations during this time. 350,000 after the final cleaning of the pocket near Smolensk. 38,561 after the destruction of Group Kashilov near Roslavl. 78,000 captured by the Second Army in the battles of Krichev and Gomel. 16,000 captured by the 24th Motorized Corps of the 2nd Panzer Group between Krichev and Gommel. 34,000 captured by Group Stuma near Velikai Luki thus, there are more than 500,000 reported prisoners in total. The losses of the German side, according to one of the documents from the Russian archives, amounted to only 101,000 men. Historian David Glantz draws attention to the fact that the number of killed for the Ninth Army in this document is obviously too low. In his opinion, this number should be 7,000 higher. 
His own estimate of the personnel losses of Army Group Center for the period 10 July, 10 September, made on the base of known German documents, gives around 115,500 killed and wounded, compared with the 760,000 losses the Soviet fronts incurred during the same period. Chapter 4 – Aftermath During the battle, the German army captured the archives of Smolensk Oblast Committee of Communist Party of the Soviet Union, a large amount of documents about local history from 1917 to 1941. The Germans used the document for propaganda about Soviet repression and transported them back to Germany. The Battle of Smolensk was another severe defeat for the Red Army, in the opening phase of Operation Barbarossa. For the first time, the Soviets tried to implement a coordinated counterattack against a large part of the front, although this counterattack turned into a military disaster, the stiffening resistance showed that the Soviets were not yet defeated and that the blitzkrieg towards Moscow was not going to be an easy undertaking. Dissent within the German high command and political leadership was exacerbated. The leaders of the general staff, Franz Holder and Braukic and commanders like Bock, Hoth and Guderian counseled against dispersing the German armored units and to concentrate on Moscow. Hitler reiterated the lack of importance of Moscow and of strategic encirclements and ordered a concentration on economic targets such as Ukraine, the Donitz Basin and the Caucasus, with more tactical encirclements to weaken the Soviets further. The German offensive effort became more fragmented, leading to the Battle of Kiev and the Battle of Uman. The battles were German victories but costly in time, men and equipment on their approach towards Moscow, allowing the Soviets time to prepare the defenses of the city.